What is up everyone, Nick here, and in today's video, I'm going to show you how to make this motorized Iron Man helmet completely wireless. And at the very end of this video, we're going to test out just how good this wireless system is and what kind of range we can get out of this helmet and this remote control. So I made this helmet for a Maker Secret Santa. This helmet is actually going to Levy 3D. I'll be posting this video after the Maker Secret Santa actually happens because I don't want to spoil it for anybody. And that's part of the reason why I decided to go with the Mark 45 helmet because this Mark 45 helmet was actually 3D modeled by Levy 3D. But with that all out of the way, let's go back to about a week ago when I finally started working on this project and I'll show you a step-by-step -step process of just how I made this helmet wireless and how I came about with the electroplated faceplate. So let's get right into it. Flashback. Listen, a good story is rarely told in a linear way anyway, so it's totally, totally fine and not at all a flaw. It's a feature. So you might be able to tell we have a mix of parts. We have some black ones, we have some light gray ones. So the black parts are actually FDM printed. They were printed on a bunch of different Elegoo printers on the Plus, on the Pro, and on the Max. And I gotta say, the quality on these prints is phenomenal. The layer lines are barely visible. They're super smooth. So sadly, this thing is not going to fit my head, but that's totally okay. And of course, we have the neck seal that goes around the neck. We have the jaw right here and we have the ears. And then we have all the light gray parts that are right here. We have the inner lip detail. We have the eyes. We have the inner vents of the faceplate and we have the cheeks. So these are all resin printed on my Mono X and these came out pretty good. So it's not gonna take too much work to get them sanded and nice and smooth when we paint these. And you might've noticed we have some parts missing here, namely the faceplate and the lip. And that's because I didn't make them myself. I ordered them from this channel sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay is the industry leader in high quality PCB manufacturing and 3D printing solutions. From custom circuit boards to innovative 3D printed prototypes, PCBWay offers unparalleled quality, fast turnaround times, and competitive pricing. So not only are they providing the PCB we're going to be using for the wireless remote, but they also provided this. This is the faceplate we're going to be using for this helmet, and it's been resin printed and electroplated gold. No words can describe how I feel about this faceplate. This faceplate is absolutely insane. It's literally a mirror. I can see myself in it. I look like the meme of the Italian man going like gabagool. Like my face is just completely distorted. <laughs> Actually, words can describe how I feel looking at this faceplate. I feel giddy. Jeez Louise, this thing just reflects light. You can literally see the shape of the lamp I'm using to illuminate the studio. Yeah, it's a rectangle. It's a big old rectangle. So the outside of this faceplate is electroplated gold, but on the inside, it's more of a metallic silver sheen and combined with the inner details that Levy 3D designed into this model, it's, it's absolutely insane. I can't believe how good this came out. So I'm probably gonna need a microfiber cloth to get rid of all my finger smudges because this thing is just covered in fingerprints, but that's totally fine. And we're gonna be taking all of this into the shop and we're going to be doing the exact same process we did in the Mark 42 helmet series where I sand and paint it. We're just going to be starting with a rough pass of 120 grit sandpaper on an electric sander. Then we're going to be using actual sandpaper and files to get rid of most of the layer lines, coat it in primer, and then just go from there, fix any imperfections with Bondo and Spot Putty, and then we're finally going to hit 400 grit sandpaper. And once everything is ready for paint, basically all these black pieces that you see here are going to be coated red. There's no masking involved. There's no secondary colors involved in any of those parts. They're just going to be red. And for the rest of these resin printed parts, they're either going to be painted silver or a matte black. And once everything is painted, we'll come back inside, start assembling it, and then we'll finally be ready to talk about the electronics. So in the end, I did end up using some different paints than what I initially thought I would be using. When I went to my local Canadian Tire, they didn't have the Rust-Oleum paint I wanted, but they had Duplicolor Metal Specs paint in red. This paint, I absolutely adore. It goes on pretty heavily. It doesn't need many coats to get really good coverage on a part, unlike their Duplicolor Perfect Match paints, which are not only tiny and expensive, but they don't cover whatsoever. You need to do multiple coats before it does anything whatsoever. Now this was fine. I was really happy when I saw this can. However, they did not have the 1K gloss clear coat. They only had the matte clear coat. Now I was a little bit worried about how this would end up looking, but I told myself it would be really good contrast between the super glossy chrome metallic parts and a matte red. I thought maybe that would look good, but when I actually applied it and I let it set, it's quite a bit glossier than what you'd expect for a matte clear coat. So I'll show you right away. 
has like a really nice shine to it. And on top of that, you have the sparkly metallic effect from the metal specs paint. And as for the resin bits, I just applied a basic metallic spray paint that I had lying around and they came out pretty good. So before we actually start assembling this stuff, we're going to be talking about how we're going to code our wireless boards. So I'm gonna move all this aside and we're gonna get right into the coding. Now I'm a total schlub when it comes to coding, but after a lot of research and a lot of mistakes, I found out that you could use these boards to wirelessly communicate with each other to activate whatever electrical components you want. Basically one acts as a button and the other one acts as an electrical output that'll trigger whatever button of whatever board you're using. So I'll be leaving a link in the description to the original video I found online where the guy shows off the code and how it works. But for the sake of this tutorial, I will be leaving a link to a GitHub with a modified version of his code. Basically the general idea is you have one of these control boards inside your glove attached to three different buttons and it can communicate with anything inside your Iron Man suit, including your helmet, ailerons, missile launcher on the arm, whatever you need. Now the wiring for this is super, super simple, but getting the code to work on these boards is by far the trickiest part of this. And the very first thing we need to do is configure Arduino so we can actually have the boards on Arduino IDE. Now this is very similar to when we uploaded code to the ATtiny85 boards when we motorized the helmet. I'll leave a link right here to where you can find that video if you're at all curious. So to add these boards onto Arduino IDE, we need to go to File and go to Preferences. And inside of Preferences, you'll see a tab called Additional Boards Manager URLs. Once you're there, you're going to have to copy and paste the link that I'll leave on screen and in the description of this video into that tab and hit OK. And then you'll see in the bottom right that the boards are being uploaded onto Arduino IDE. Now, if you go to tools and you go to select board and you type Wemos, they should appear as an option. Next up, we need to download some libraries onto Arduino. So you'll need to go onto libraries, type out ESP8266 and download it. So this will enable two things that we need working in our code. This will enable ESPNow.h and it'll also enable ESP8266 Wi-Fi.h. And once you've completed those steps, you're basically ready to start uploading the codes onto the boards. But that's if you're lucky. If you get your boards from a reputable source, they should work no problem. But if you start ordering them from AliExpress like I did, you're most likely going to run into some issues where the code either doesn't upload to the board or it doesn't function correctly on the boards and they're not communicating with each other. Now there are two things you can do. Number one is go into device manager if you're using a PC and upload a different version of the drivers for the board. Now, if you're using a regular Wemos D1 Mini, the drivers that you'll need to download from the internet are CH340 drivers. And if you're using the Wemos D1 Mini Pro, which I highly recommend because it's compatible with the PCB we'll be using later on, you'll need to download CP210 drivers. If you need more information on how to install drivers, I'll leave a link in the description to where you can find that information. But again, if you buy it from a reputable source, it should technically have the correct drivers already installed on the board, and it should be able to run the code with no issues. So this is a case by case basis. You might have no issues and you might be like me and have all the issues. So let's say for all intents and purposes, our boards are now functional. Let me show you how to upload the code to the boards. So when programming these wireless boards, it's important that we start with the receiver board, the one that's going to be receiving data from the transmitter because we need to know what its MAC address is. Now, the way I understand it is a MAC address is basically an electronic signature. So this board, which is the transmitter, knows it needs to communicate with this board in particular and not a different Wemos board. So we're gonna plug this into our computer. We're going to open Arduino IDE and we're going to open up the receiver code. So you can probably tell just by looking at it, we have code for button one, for button two, and for button three, which is perfect. So basically it's going to be receiving data from those button pins on the other board. And we also have the output of the LED pins. So we have digital five, digital four, and zero. Technically this should be two and three on the board, but you can just grab an LED and test it out to see which is which. Now we're going to upload it to the board. So make sure that you have Lolin Wemos D1 Mini selected and it's on COM6 for the USB and we can just hit upload. And as you can see, the percentage is increasing and the light on the board is flickering. Now it's hard resetting via the RTS pin and it's done uploading. So if we go to tools and we go to serial monitor and we press the reset button, boom, we have initializing slave mode. My MAC address is 
485519E019B. Now, whichever MAC address appears on your screen when you're uploading the code to your receiver board, please take note of it or take a picture of it because we're going to need it later when uploading the code to the transmitter board. So we can now unplug this board and we can set up our transmitter board. So let's plug it in and let's open up the transmitter code. So here we have our transmitter code. You'll see these three lines. These are the only lines of code that we'll need to modify. So you'll see the very first one, receiver address one, I already typed in the MAC address of our receiver board. Now, if you wanna communicate with two other boards, all you need to do is replace the zeros with the MAC addresses of whatever other boards you need to communicate with. And once that's all set up, we can just hit upload and it should upload to the board. Let's open up the serial monitor one more time. And as we can see, there's data transmitting, but we're getting an error code because this board is currently disconnected. So if you grab a power bank and you grab a USB cable, you'll see that the data in the serial monitor will change and now it will all be sent successfully. So every single line here is data sent successfully, which is perfect. So if we wanna make sure that our whole setup works, all we need is an LED and a scrap piece of wire. So we're gonna grab the LED, we're going to connect it to D1 and to ground. Now you'll see that the LED turns on, which is great. And here is my scrap piece of wire. I'm going to feed this through the ground pin and I'm gonna make contact with the digital one pin. The LED turns off and when I release it, the LED turns right back on. Excellent, so everything works. We can now start configuring this into the wiring diagram of our helmet and to the PCB for the remote control we're going to be using. So here we have all the components we're going to need for the remote control. I've already gone ahead and done all the soldering. I soldered the Wemos board to the PCB. I soldered all the GST PH connectors to the PCB as well. And I have my 3D prints ready. So for the remote control, we have three main parts. We have the casing itself, we have the cover, and we also have the button, which is gonna slot right in there just like so. The base of the remote control itself is going to need four M3 threaded inserts which are going to be melted into the plastic and of course four M3 screws to go along with those so that we can screw the cover onto the base. You're also going to need a tiny momentary switch with a long stem. This is going to be soldered to a JST PH connector. This is going to go to J1 on the PCB board. This is for the button itself. And next up we have this assembly, which is for the power and the switch. Now this is nothing too complicated. We have the female end of a JST PH connector, the red wire being the power going to one end of the switch, and then another red wire going from the other end of the switch to a male end of the JST PH connector, which is going to connect to the board. Now this little switch is going to allow you to turn on and off the PCB board, that way we're not wasting power. And lastly, we have the battery itself. Personally, I'm using a tiny 3.7 volt LiPo because it has a JST PH connector and that's just practical for me. And lastly, this is totally optional, but I feel like this is quite useful. This is an LED connected to a JST PH connector. This is going to go to J4 on the board. Basically, when we turn on the switch, allowing power to go to the board, this LED is going to blink on, which is going to show us that the board is on. And as far as assembly goes, it's nothing too complicated. We just have to connect all the JST connectors together, and then we have to glue the button onto the bottom of this cover, and then glue the button onto the stem of this little momentary button. And there you have it. We have a complete 3D printed remote control that we can use for basically anything that we want to connect to our Wemos board. So if you're curious on how I made this remote control, I basically spent an afternoon in Tinkercad, made a few prototypes and landed on this design. If you want to get your very own files, I'll be leaving a link in the description to a Thingiverse page where you can download these files. So when it comes to soldering this board up, we're basically going to need two JST PH connectors. One of them is going to go to the switch pin on whatever board we're using, and the other one is going to be for power. So that makes for a total of four wires we need to solder to this. So we have one red wire, which is going to go to the 3.3 power input. Then we have another red wire, which is going to go to the switch output, which is D1 on this board. And then the two ground wires are going to be soldered together and they're going to go to the ground pin on this board. And now that the electronics are complete, I installed them in the helmet and voila. 
<laughs> so not only do we have the faceplate that's all electroplated, but we have all the electronics inside which will allow us to motorize the faceplate. So of course we have a mount for the servos that drive the faceplate up and down. We have LED eyes installed. We have a 3D printed case right here for all the electronics. Basically there's a breakout board for an Arduino Nano and we have the Wemos D1 mini board in there which is for the wireless control. And right behind that, we have this battery pack for four double A's and that basically powers everything inside the helmet. So if we just flip the on button and set it down, turn on the remote control and it should open up just like that. That's awesome. Since the faceplate is resin and it's electroplated, it's a little bit heavier than your average 3D printed faceplate. So I just figured I wouldn't even bother with MG90S servos, I would just use those high torque servos just to be safe and make sure that it actually works. And boy, does it work. Ah, oh, this thing is wicked. Now I did mention that I wanted to do some tests with this helmet. Basically, I'm gonna take it outside and I'm gonna start opening and closing the faceplate. And as I do that, I'm slowly gonna walk away and we're just gonna test out the range of this wireless system. So let's go do that right now. All right, so we're in a nondescript field. The helmet is right over here on the ground. I have a secondary camera running right now. So just from a few feet away, the helmet still works. Now I'm gonna take a few steps away. So I don't know, let's take two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten ish paces away. And let's see what we got. Still working just fine. Still working. I'm straight up just in the middle of a field. It's disgusting out here. It still works. And I can hear the servos whirring from here. Hi camera, hi camera B. Oh, it's muddy. Oh no, I should have worn boots. I'm pretty far out now, let's see. I wonder if you guys can even see the camera from here. It still works. This is starting to get pretty nutty. Okay. It's still working. Oh, maybe not. Maybe not, it opened, but now it's not closing anymore. Let's see if I can't get any closer and have it work. Maybe it's the remote. Let me reset the remote. Oh, it just closed. Yeah, we seem to be having some issues at this range. Huh, it's not working. It's not working. This seems to be about the max range, about 100 meters away. There's no obstructions, of course, but it does work pretty well indoors, even with walls. I'd say it's like fairly consistent at this range. But again, why would you be activating it from 150 meters away? I don't know. So I'm gonna go back inside and we're gonna wrap up this video. So bye-bye. And now that we know that this helmet actually works, it's time to clean it up, get rid of some of the handprints on the electroplated faceplate and pack it. Because like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this is actually a gift for Levy 3D for a Maker Secret Santa. I am absolutely in love with this helmet, but as much as it pains me to do so, this is a gift for Levy. So let's pack it up and send it to him and I'll try to include some videos of him actually opening it up. I see, I see a little step here. I recognize okay. that little step there. What's that? Oh my god. Is that a Lego? Oh my goodness. Is it the Lego helmet? Oh my goodness. Please tell me it's the Lego helmet. Lego helmet. Gotta be his ear motorization. Lego helmet. Lego helmet. Lego helmet. Lego helmet. Lego helmet. Lego helmet. Oh my unsheeted bed. Holy what shit. Is oh that my god. god. Oh my god. god. Holy what shit! The, this is no. Who wrapped that? Who, that? Who, that? Who, that? Who, that? Who did that? Who did that? Who did that? I don't think that's the Lego helmet. Yeah, that's not the Lego helmet. How the I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you found it informative, please let me know in the comments down below. Leave suggestions for future videos. And thank you again to our sponsor, PCBWay, for sponsoring this video and for sponsoring the channel in general. And I really hope to see you all in the next one.